Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's 10 o'clock. Uh, it's our time. Uh, thank you so much for coming uh, so numerously to this exciting event and be here today with us at the Faculty of Informatics and Information Technologies of the Slovak University of Technology in Bratislava. My name is Jan Solga. I am the Vice Rector for Science and PhD Studies and I'm formally just opening today's event. Uh, it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome, on behalf of our rector, Professor Fikar, a distinguished scientist, one of the most famous alumna of our university, Professor Ruzhena Bajci here. Please. I would also uh, extend my thanks to Laura Hallock, who is accompanying her, and thanks to both of them uh, for uh, taking uh, the invitation and delivering uh, lectures here at the university uh, today. Uh, I would also like to extend our thanks to the University in Žilina for organizing the stay of Professor Bajč in Slovakia, the Faculty of Informatics and Information Technologies for the invitation to be in Bratislava, and for the Asset Science Award for supporting both actions. Now I would like to call uh, Professor Maria Bielikova, Dean of the Faculty of Informatics and Information Technologies, to take over the lead, uh, convene the session, introduce both speakers, uh, and take care of us. Thank you. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear our professor, uh, dear Laura, uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here. Actually, I usually I'm not so nervous, but now I am quite nervous. Uh, I have several reasons for it. It's really a great occasion for us. I, my father born in the same year as uh, Professor Baichi. So I'm, I feel like I can be her, 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 uh, uh, daughter, and I heard we, we studied at the same <coughs> uh, university, but in different times and in really different, uh, not just times, uh, because uh, the world is now uh, different. People are still the same. They, I believe that they are patient about uh, many things. They are keen to have knowledge, but in some regimes, something was possible and something uh, wasn't possible. And I heard quite a lot about her. Actually, my very good friend was and is uh, Janka Koszecka. Uh, Janka was uh, uh, my friend who, who visiting us, who visit uh, our uh, kids and so on. There are more people knowing Janka. And I know that Janka was... Uh, a student of uh, Professor Baichi, so we have quite a lot of in common. We have much more in common uh, because uh, last year we celebrated here uh, 60, 55 years of starting of computer science at uh, Czechoslovakia, I can say, because uh, here at the Slovak University of Technology, uh, before it was called Slovenska Technická Univerzita, uh, on Faculty of uh, Electrical Engineering, there was uh, Ural 2 computer installed, the first computer in Czechoslovakia. And uh, we were discussing about the history. We were mentioned Professor Gvozdiak, who is a really great figure of uh, uh, Slovakia uh, computer science. Uh, Maybe if he will not be here, some other will be, but he was there. He, he wrote first uh, textbook about uh, computers at, this, at that time called, it was called in Slovakia, Samočinne Počítače. Um, <clears throat> and then started uh, um, a department of uh, mathematical machines. And I found out that uh, our distinguished guest uh, was there at that time. Uh, she was uh, uh, his uh, uh, student, 
and uh, he was probably the most uh, influenced person who took her to US, who, who made uh, real the opportunity to uh, meet and to study with uh, John McCarthy. You probably know that he's uh, one of the founders of artificial intelligence, which is second thing which connects us all, uh, which uh, all, all of us here, and maybe some my students know from my lectures on functional programming about John McCarthy as, as well. Uh, I will not uh, speak a lot of about the history, but I felt that I have to tell at least something because uh, we have uh, the same roots, and I am very proud of it. And <clears throat> Uh, you can find quite a lot of uh, information about uh, our distinguished guest. Some of it is on uh, leaflet. Uh, you got. Uh, you just click, and you will find that uh, we now have here in in our room uh, one of uh, 50 the most uh, uh, distinguished and, and famous uh, women in in science. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether you know this feeling. I never met. Uh, Professor Rujena. I met her half an hour ago, but I feel so big friendship to her, so I believe that all of us uh, will um, uh, spend uh, today very nice time with her. I am proud to tell that uh, in Slovakia uh, we started uh, to take science uh, more seriously last years. Uh, Still, it's uh, much underestimated. Still, the budget is very low. But uh, more and more people, from uh, not just from academia, but from industry, is crying that we need uh, more science. We need uh, good scientists. I am glad that uh, uh, our uh, media uh, understand this, and they started to support us. And this event can support uh, Slovak science. I believe that it can support Slovak science as well. So I take it in this way. And it can support uh, Slovak AI, uh, which is a uh, very young uh, Slovak center of, uh, for uh, uh, research in artificial intelligence, which connects all of us. So I, I want to invite you, all of you, uh, to register for, for and to, to uh, show support. Uh, just before uh, um, our lecture, uh, we, we will have two lectures. Uh, one will be uh, given by uh, Laura Hallock, which is who is a doctoral student of uh, Professor Baichi, and second will be uh, given by Professor Baichi, and we will have discussion after each of these. I will pass a word uh, to uh, Asset uh, Science Award uh, as. I am very grateful for them, uh, not just because supporting this event, but because showing activities I, I, I was uh, telling just before to supporting science in Slovakia. Thank you. Dear Professor Baiti, <laughs> dear Vice Rectors, um, dear science lovers, dear distinguished scientists and all of you present in this room. Thanks to Professor Bielikova for this nice and kind forward. Thank you. Uh, I'm here representing the ESET Science Award, uh, which was introduced by the ESET Foundation as a new initiative to support excellence in Slovak science and excellent scientists that we have in here in Slovakia. We truly believe that high quality science is something that can bring our country forward. That's why we are working on this. That's why we established uh, an international jury headed by Dan Schechtman, a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry uh, from 2011. And uh, we will award three laureates in next October 2019 in three categories. Uh, we will award an excellent scientist, a young talent, and also an important category for us 
is uh, the education part. So we will also award an excellent or an outstanding personality in university academics. I'm very glad and I want to thank the, the University of Žilina and I want to thank the Slovak Technical University and the Slovak AI, of course, that we have the opportunity to support such a great visit. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I hope and I believe that we will all uh, enjoy this unique personality that we have in here. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this was not in the program, but let me just tell you something. I am humbled to be here where I really started my scientific career. I had an emotionally hard time to come back because of the memories that we all collectively have carried. But it's time to time to turn the page over. And I am so happy and honored to be here where I started my electrical engineering and then later on computer science career. I also want to tell you that we forged this collaboration between University of Žilina thanks to President Kiska and Peter Kmetz, who kind of helped me to bring these people and arranged for this collaboration. And that's another reason why I'm here visiting Žilina. But I am hoping that this country is too small to be Žilina versus Bratislava versus whatever else. We have to work together in order to really compete in this highly technological competitive world. So I hope that this will be a start between Žilina and Bratislava and maybe others. And thank you very much for your invitation. And now I give word to my one of my very best students, Laura Hallock. I think so. It's working, right? Okay. Um, well, <laughs> thank you so much for the introduction, Rujana. Um, uh, as she mentioned, I um, have had the privilege to work um, as a PhD student uh, with Rujana Baichi for the last four years now. Um, and in our lab, um, Rujna has done you know, a multitude of things over her career, um, ranging from you know, imaging, computer vision, to, to robotics. Um, and these days, uh, we've, we've sort of formed the Human Assistive Robotic Technologies Lab. Um, so we use a lot of uh, techniques in, in AI and robotics, um, specifically to better study and model the human part of the system, um, both in you know, high-level uh, human-robot interaction settings um, and also in uh, sort of lower granularity, um, actually looking at musculoskeletal modeling. Um, and since that's the piece that, that I'm currently working on, um, that's what I'll be, be talking to you uh, about today. So this is kind of a, a sample of the kind of research that we do, do in the Heart Lab. Um, but Rujna will also, of course, present um, several other students' projects in, in, in her talk afterwards, uh, which I know is what you're, you're really here to see. Um, but um, today I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, modeling muscle forces. Um, and because I know most of you in the room are probably more uh, in AI or robotics, uh, I want to start just by motivating why um, we might care about this problem. Um, so, you know, it turns out despite, you know, all these sensors that we have, um, we still don't have a good way of measuring what individual muscles are doing. Uh, and if we really want to understand um, the way that humans move and the way that other animals move so dexterously and so well, we really need to, to actually understand the actuators, um, understand how, how that works. Um, specifically, I want to highlight a couple of applications. Uh, one is uh, control of assistive devices. Uh, so 
I don't know if you, you follow the field at all, but um, you know, there's lots of really cool uh, you know, fake hands, uh, prosthetic hands, and, and things like that that you know, look like human hands, that have all the right joints and all the right places. Um, and they all kind of do this. Um, none of them have that much dexterity, um, and part of that is because we don't know how to extract enough control signals uh, from, from you know, the residual arm or whatever residual strength they have. Um, and so the hope is if we can really understand uh, what the internal actuators are doing and measure them, uh, maybe we can start getting more control signals. Um, and similarly, that's sort of the expressive control part of this, um, but in addition to that, um, we want to be able to understand, if we do put a device on a person, what kind of forces we're imparting back on that person and what kind of forces we're causing them to generate. Um, so that's another reason, you know, safe control of these devices that we might care. Uh, secondly, we just fundamentally don't understand uh, how humans do what we do. Um, you know, this is somebody contact juggling, but even just in the course of the day when we pick up a water bottle and don't spill it all over ourselves, um, these are motions that robots can't do yet. Um, and so hopefully, if we start to understand how humans are doing it, um, we can start developing better control schemes for our own devices. Um, and then thirdly, um, there are, you know, lots of things can go wrong. Um, so there are lots of, you know, you can have a spinal cord injury. Um, as you age, you can get Parkinson's disease, things like that. Um, all of those things affect your ability to, to execute musculoskeletal control. Um, and since we don't even understand the healthy system yet, um, it's, it's very hard to understand and diagnose and treat those pathologies well. Um, so hopefully, you know, when we, when we better understand the system, um, we can start treating, treating and evaluating treatments better. So, you know, measuring these individual muscle forces is not a new idea. Um, some of you in the audience may be in, in biomedical engineering, um, and people do try to probe the system. Uh, most commonly, uh, they'll use something called uh, surface electromyography. Um, so these are little electrodes that, that go on your skin. Uh, you can also use a needle and put them inside the muscles themselves. Um, but basically, that measures the, the input signal from your brain into your arm. Um, or whatever you're looking at, um, then you know, that, that electrical signal gets processed by some sort of contraction dynamics, um, and you can kind of try to infer what this, this muscle force is. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of problems with this signal. Um, one, you know, this is a very complicated box, um, and this is fundamentally an input signal that you're measuring. So there's all kinds of dynamics here that we're not even you know, measuring or, or probing. Um, it's very noisy. You're only getting you know, a little piece of the muscle, and you're not even really sure which piece that is because it's such an aggregate signal. Um, so, so for our work, um, and this is the, the sort of novel part, uh, we're trying something a little bit different. So in addition to you know, your muscle outputting force when it executes these contraction dynamics, it also deforms. So as your, as your muscle exerts force or as it moves around, uh, it changes shape. Um, and that shape change is something that we can measure using ultrasound. So, you know, given this system, this is a mechanical signal. Um, it, it happens after that complex neurological relationship. So, if all we want to start is these muscle forces, we can actually just, you know, find a find a mapping here, find this function g, and and abstract away the uh, the brain until we want to explicitly study it. Um, so we can we cannot deal with this complicated box until we we know what to do with it. So, so just to, to really make this concrete, um, the core hypothesis of this work um, is that individual muscle force can be inferred from this deformation, and this is something that we can detect via ultrasound. So I'll, I'll present some of our preliminary work today that, that shows that that might be the case. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about the second piece of, you know, the reason that we can do this um, has to do with the actual mechanism by which your muscles impart force to your skeleton. Um, so the way that you move is that your muscles will ratchet together, and that pulls the tendon, which changes its stiffness, and that actually finally imparts the force to the skeleton. Um, so I'll talk about that in more depth in a second. So again, we're trying to measure individual muscle forces um, in vivo, so you know, not cadavers, um, <laughs> actual humans, um, using ultrasound based on these shape changes under loading. So fundamentally, uh, what my goal as a researcher to do um, is to develop a model that can tell us you know, what this muscle force is uh, and validate it in some way uh, to confirm that we're actually measuring what we think we're measuring. Um, so you know, this, is, this is sort of the core of the work, and I'll talk about that today. Um, but in order to do this, um, first you need data, um, which is something Ruzhina will be highlighting a lot in the, in the second part of the talk. And 
as far as we can tell, no one has ever really tried using this signal in this way before. Um, so a large part of my project has actually just been generating uh, a preliminary data set to start to try to tease out where some of these signals might live. Um, so, so the core of what I've actually accomplished so far, um, a lot of it relates to just generating this data set. Um, so, so these are the two pieces I think I'll highlight most, depending on, depending on time today. Um, I'll also, at the end, if there's time, um, see ya. Um, chat a little bit about some proof of concept applications that I'm excited about, um, and also look at, look at some other sensors that we're looking at. Um, so with that, I'll kind of move on to this, this first uh, section of the talk about this exploratory data set generation. So, you know, I, sh I showed you this picture before of this mapping that we're trying to create. Uh, you know, the force is some function of this deformation. Um, let's just talk a little more in depth about what this model should look like. So, as I mentioned before, um, basically, I talked about basically your, your brain uh, will send a signal to your spine, which sends a signal to your peripheral nervous system. That electrical signal goes into your muscle. Uh, that, that causes the muscle to, to ratchet inward. Um, that pulls these tendons here. Um, and that eventually causes the, the output force, um, in this case, at the wrist. Um, so under the assumption that these muscles are isovolumetric, they're not changing volume, uh, that means that this cross-sectional area in the middle should increase as we pull, as we pull inward. Um, based on you know, how much, how much uh, input you're getting. Um, so so you know, if we were you know, rigid bodies or if we were, we were actually ellipsoidal, this is what we, we, we would expect um, if, if humans were simpler. Um, but there's a couple of things that we have, you know, through some preliminary experiments, realized um, make this challenging. So first of all, um, depending on where you measure along the arm, you might see something completely different from this nice you know, increase in cross-sectional area thickness equals more force. So this is looking at um, a particular elbow flexor, the brachioradialis, that causes your elbow to flex along three different places of the forearm. So depending on at, at you know, two different conditions, not exerting force and exerting force. So you know, if you, depending on where you look, you might see this nice um, you know, cross-sectional area increases when you increase force. Um, or you might see something totally different and unrelated um, because of the way that the muscle is sliding around and the contact dynamics related to it. So, you know, there's not this nice one-to-one, -one, um, you know, more cross-section equals more, more force. Uh, so, well, that's one, one complication. Um, I call it the humans are squishy problem uh, because it would be really easy if we were rigid body robots. Um, so, secondly, um, not only, you know, depending on where you measure, the forces do things look different, um, but actually just depending on the kinematic configuration of your arm. Uh, so not considering forces at all, even if someone is just externally moving your arm, uh, depending on the angle of your elbow, um, the different cross-sectional area changes will look completely different. So at three different angles, the, the deformations look different. Um, so we're, what we're dealing with is, you know, we want to find these forces, but that's occurring in the presence of this massive uh, kinematic associated deformation. Um, and from these little, you know, cross-sections that I've showed you so far, um, from, you know, one slice of an ultrasound, um, it's, it's not at all clear, you know, how you should start building these models. So, um, really, our first, our first step in this process, if we want to study this, uh, needs to be observing the whole muscle um, under multiple different you know, joint configurations and multiple different loading conditions, um, ideally factorial, so looking at all combinations. Um, so that's kind of what we started with, um, is you know, generating this initial data set. Uh, and the way that we did that um, was using ultrasound, um, cheaper and easier and faster than MRI, um, using ultrasound um, with motion capture. Um, so basically tracking the ultrasound probe in space, um, that allows you, and, and you know, under a particular condition, um, scanning that ultrasound probe up and down the arm to generate these full 3D scans of the arm. So again, using, um, using motion capture to track the position of this probe and having the human stay still. Uh, we can localize each of those scans in space and generate what looks a little bit like a, um, like a messy MRI. Um, you get full three-dimensional data using this system. Once we have that, um, we can look at where the muscle fascia that separate each bundle, look, bundle are, and we can actually annotate, even just by hand, uh, where each muscle is. So in this case, you'll see that this pink here is the biceps, so this muscle here, um, and you can see some of the other flexors and other colors. Um, and what we ultimately end up with is this nice 3D data of muscle, full 3D data of muscles um, that, we can, that we can process um, and, and we can analyze. So 
uh, a quick look at, uh, you know, the initial data set that we took. Um, so as I mentioned, we want to be looking under multiple joint positions and enforced conditions. So that's what we did. Uh, we started with a couple of subjects. Um, we took, you know, full anterior surface of the arm scans. Um, and we looked at four different angles, so from full extension all the way up to 90 degrees flexion, um, and five different loading conditions. So either fully supported, just looking at kinematic deformation, um, or weighted at the wrist at, uh, at different loads. And a quick look at, at this data set itself. Um, so even, you know, just qualitative data is brand new in this space. No one, no one has, really, uh, has really generated this kind of a data set before. Um, but we can start to see some evidence that our, you know, that predicted model um, might be at least roughly true. Um, so we can see, if you look at, at different angles, um, you can kind of see the muscle deforming and sliding up the arm, um, as we thought. Um, and, a, and actually, if you look at different, so if you look at the same angle under different force conditions, you can kind of start to see that, it's, uh, that it gets thicker depending on, you know, when you, when you exert more force. Um, so even that is a new result. It sounds very simple. Um, but, you know, this isn't something that we, we had confirmed before then. Um, and actually, you know, this, this is a data set that, that might be useful to, to a number of communities, you know, in or, in, in or out of this field. Uh, so we've released this data set um, and actually its successor. Um, I was just at EMBC presenting the, uh, the OpenARM 2.0 uh, data set. Um, so if anyone in this room is, is in biomechanics, we're happy to share it. Um, it's already online. Um, so that, you know, other people can work with this data as well. So, I think that the, you know, we generated this initial data set, and that's great, but this is a single subject, um, and that's, um, you know, it's very limited what you, can, what you can conclude from a single person. So we've spent, um, you know, and, and one of the actual, um, the most challenging parts of this, of this process has been uh, annotating the data set. Um, it's fairly straightforward, it's not difficult, um, because it's basically, you know, high-tech coloring if you do it manually. Um, but it is uh, very, very time intensive. So, you know, you're doing, you know, hundreds or thousands of slices per scan, um, and that can take, you know, a human expert, you know, tens of hours for, for just a single scan. Um, maybe 10 to 12, I think, is the average um, for, for a single muscle, which is intractable if you want to scale this up. So our, our, a lot of our, our, um, our work thus far has actually been uh, automating this process. So this is maybe a more familiar slide to, to the AI crowd in this room. Uh, doing this automated segmentation uh, using a convolutional neural network. Um, so specifically, we use the UNET architecture, um, which is an architecture um, designed to work well with, um, with uh, medical data that, that works well with uh, limited data sets um, and has been pre-trained on a number of data sets. Um, and so we, we actually just used the 2D version of the unit. So we took individual slices of these, these 3D scans. Um, sorry, it's a little pale on this projector. Um, and then each, you know, once this unit has been trained, uh, we used it to generate the, the corresponding segmentation, um, and you can use that to generate the, the full 3D scan just by, by stacking those together. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of um, flip back and forth between the ground truth and the... Uh, in the, in the, in the ML-segmented uh, versions. You'll notice it's not perfect. Um, but, you know, with some smoothing, um, a lot of our analysis is already possible. Um, and we're okay, actually, with a little bit of manual cleanup if it's necessary. Um, so this is a really promising avenue that we're still refining to, to actually generate these, these large data sets. And I can, uh, I can talk a little bit about, you know, the, the actual results of, of, of the paper we just presented on, on generating this data. Um, so, um, but I think for time, I'll, I'll kind of blaze through this. Um, basically, our, our convolutional network method works better than sort of classical image registration. Feel free to ask questions at the end if you like. Um, but I'd really like to wrap up this, this data set section and, and mostly chat about, about modeling, um, because that's, that's really my, my interest uh, 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 going forward. So yeah, we're doing okay on time. Um, so, the core of my thesis, um, as I mentioned initially, um, is, is related to this, this model development. Um, we're, and this is something that we're just starting to work on. Um, so a lot of our time thus far has been generating these, these preliminary data sets. Um, and, and now we're starting to actually develop models. Um, so what you'll see here um, is mostly proposed research. Um, and so I'm you know, happy to take feedback if anybody is in the field. Um, so you won't see, you'll see a few preliminary results, but, but mostly talking about our, our plans going forward. 
So, um, you know, we, we presented this simplified model initially. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about, you know, using this preliminary data set, um, how close is what we observe um, in, a, in a quantifiable way to this, to this simplified model? So um, we, can, we can start, start probing that, that, um, those conditions by looking at uh, individual slices along the length of the arm, uh, so once we've aligned everything, um, and looking at these metrics that we think are representative. Um, so looking at cross-sectional area um, and thickness of the muscle. So um, we, can start, we can start to make a few, a few conclusions that are, um, you know, that, that, that you know, even just using one data set, we can see if we're seeing what we think we should. Um, so, you know, thickness is a little bit messy, so I won't chat too much about that. Um, but cross-sectional area, actually, you can already start to see, um, if you look at three different angles of the arm, um, as, it, as your elbow uh, flexion angle increases, you can actually kind of see the muscle squish up, um, squish up along the arm and, and become fatter. So if you look at, it's kind of hard to see on this projector, but if you look at the, the quadratic fits to these different uh, cross-sectional area curves, um, the one, the blue one, the 90 degree one, is actually taller and fatter. Um, and so you can see that phenomenon that we expected. But as I mentioned before, you know, our real interest is not in this, uh, this cross-sectional, uh, or sorry, is not in this uh, kinematic deformation, it's in the dynamic deformation, so the, or, or static, um, the, the force-associated deformation. Um, so really what we want to look at is, you know, how this cross-sectional area at a particular location changes uh, with force exertion. So now if we look at each angle, so 30, 60, um, 30, 60, and 90, um, and we look at you know, the difference in cross-section between the low force and the high force conditions, uh, we can actually see that there's a nice um, you know, location in which maximum change is achieved. So um, you know, if you say, if you wanted to um, use this signal for something in terms of knowing what the force was, uh, that might be a good place to put a transducer along the arm. That's kind of a, a nice low-hanging fruit result for de device control. So, um, you know, there is, despite the fact that this muscle is shifting around, there's a location in which we can robustly measure this change. And interestingly, you know, you would think, based on our initial model, that that would happen sort of at the center of the muscle belly. Um, but that's not what we see. You know, the, the, the sort of peak of, of, of the, uh, the muscle cross-section is at a different place on the arm. Uh, so that's something that wasn't really known before, and that's a more scientific result. So, you know, cross-sectional area, um, as we showed, isn't really the whole story. Um, and you, know, you have cross-sectional area changes with both uh, kinematics and dynamics. Um, and so we've started trying to probe you know, what, what might these control signals actually look like if we're trying to discriminate between, between these two different, uh, two different conditions. Um, and so one, way, one, one framework that we're looking at is something called statistical shape modeling. It's, a, it's essentially principal component analysis for shapes. Um, so we can parameterize a particular cross-section um, as a bunch of you know, points along the contour or even inside the muscle. Um, and then we can decompose that into a mean shape um, and its, uh, and its uh, corresponding you know, eigenvectors of covariance. Um, and that gives us what's actually a pretty, a pretty low dimensional signal. So you can, you know, in maybe three or four components, uh, describe the signal, most of the variants of the signal pretty well. So, so to illustrate how you, know, you might start to use this, um, we, can, uh, we can look at um, these, these principal component vectors um, over um, a couple of different conditions. So first, looking at the case in which there's uh, no force, um, so no force, but just you know, passively varying the angle of your arm, uh, you can see that most of the variance occurs um, over on this side. Um, so due, in this case, you know, due to gravity, as someone's passively moving your arm up, it's kind of sliding off to the side. Um, in the other case, um, if, you're, if you're looking at just the, the 30 degree angle, but increasing the force, you can start to see that the muscle will bulge up in kind of this area. Um, and so that would be a way we can at least start seeing that these deformations look different, um, even if it's not clear explicitly yet how to, how to transform this into a control signal. Um, we know the information is, is there. So, you know, this is, this is one way that you could start to model this. Um, but I want to describe, you know, some of the challenges associated with trying to, trying to come up with these systems. Um, so, um, you know, we have this simplified model, but there's tons of other dynamics that I haven't really showed you yet. Uh, one is that, you know, your, your biceps isn't the only thing pulling here. Um, you've got lots of different muscles uh, working together, and it's not really clear how. Uh, they're pushing against each other laterally. Um, they, there's a lot of contact forces. Um, there's a huge amount of just geometric complexity that I'm totally, uh, you know, alighting over. Um, 
this is not a perfect line. It's some sort of a curve in three dimensions. Uh, the fibers of a muscle are at a particular angle. Um, these fibers aren't points pulling on a particular point on the bone. They're thick and they're wrapped around these different structures. Um, all of this is an approximation. Um, in addition, you know, within a, within a single muscle, there's a huge amount of mechanical complexity. Uh, so if you've heard of you know, fast twitch and slow twitch fibers, those behave differently. Um, you know, muscles behave differently depending on their history, depending on um, whether they're moving with the motion or against the motion. Um, and you know, nobody understands fatigue, as far as I can tell. Um, uh, in addition to that, you know, we've been abstracting away this, this system over here, um, but fundamentally the way that your nervous system is controlling your muscles matters. Um, you know, it's, it's not activating a single muscle bundle at a time, it's activating individual motor units within that muscle. Um, there are different, you know, there's tetanic and subtetanic con contraction, which are, which are different mechanisms. Uh, and there's a huge amount of you know, feedback and feed forward loops in the system that we don't understand. Um, so just to kind of highlight the challenges here, um, I've kind of colored these by, you know, green is, I think if we tried really, really hard, we could maybe measure it uh, all the way through to red, which is I have no idea how to measure it. Um, although I did see an interesting motor unit paper at EMBC. Um, but in any case, you know, there's, there's some fundamental things here that are gonna be really hard to measure. And so really the challenge here um, is that you know, for my applications, I'm interested in better scientific understanding of the muscle because I think, you know, the better understanding we have, um, the, the more applications that this is useful to. But the challenge is every time you start to try to impose this structure on your muscles, you're going to have to assume some of these red values and some of the things that we can't measure. So, you know, you take one step into using more model-based approaches um, and you have to start assuming things from literature that you may or may not be true. Um, so it's not clear, you know, where on this black box to white box modeling spectrum we should fall. So what I'm proposing is actually a suite of models. So a principled way of trying a bunch of different kinds of models um, in a way that they're actually comparable and we can figure out which models are best representative of our data. Um, and as a side note, you know, this can maybe help validate those literature values that we aren't sure of um, and, see, and see if they're actually true. So, um, I, this is going to be the mathiest section of the talk, <laughs> um, and I'll breeze through it, thing, you know, because we don't have that much time. Um, but I just, I'll give you the high-level bits, um, so don't worry too much about the individual equations. So, um, as I mentioned, um, what I'm interested in is a, a spectrum of possible models that can describe what we're seeing. So. Inputs and outputs of the system, that's really the important thing. So I'm thinking about a situation in which our model um, gets one cross section of the, of the muscle, um, and that's you know, gonna generate, from, that, from, that, from that, uh, that image, we're gonna generate some kind of a deformation signal. Um, it could look like the, the statistical shapes of the cross section area like we were showing before. Um, and I'll also give it, give it the, the system kinematics, the, the elbow angle theta, um, because that's something that we can measure uh, using other sensors like goniometers. Really what we want to infer um, first to start is just this output torque since we can measure that, um, but eventually the muscle force is inside the system. So, um, the, the sort of most straightforward, I think from an AI, AI perspective thing to do uh, would be just, you know, have some sort of a model-free baseline. So either you could actually just use the pixel values here if you didn't want to use, uh, even impose like a statistical shape model on it. But basically just, you know, saying our output torque that we deserve, uh, observe is some sort of, uh, you know, function of these two signals. Uh, this could be, you know, everybody's favorite. It could be a neural network, um, but it could also be something a little bit more sophisticated. Um, so, you know, this tells us something, and maybe we can predict something that's useful for device control. Um, but really what we want is we want to probe these individual forces inside the system. And the first way, the first structure that you have to impose is that this muscle is occurring in the presence of, of other muscles as well. So you need some sort of a model of how forces are distributed across these different muscle groups. Um, and so, you know, you start having to assume something. Um, one thing you could assume is that, you know, it's a, it's a linear function of, of whatever you see in this, this biceps here. You know, they're working together depending on the angle. Um, but again, I'm going to start highlighting in orange the things that you're having to assume from literature. Uh, one is this, uh, you know, this, this particular constant. But if we model it this way, we can actually probe what this predicted individual force is um, and see if it's consistent. Um, we could be a little bit more sophisticated with this. We could actually you know, use literature values to, to infer this, this distribution in a little more uh, of a... a, a um, of a rigorous way, but again, we're having to assume more things. Um, 
and secondly, you know, we could instead of, you know, and, and still using this, this sort of black box model for the biceps, biceps deformation itself, biceps force itself, um, but, you know, we could unblack box this model as well. We could say um, the, the, you know, the muscle deformation is ultimately generating a length change in the muscle and the tendon. Um, and so then we can, you know, break that up into muscle dynamics and tendon dynamics. Um, and tendons can be, you know, basically a spring um, is what this is showing. Uh, but then you have to start assuming, you know, where things are attached, um, which isn't one point. So you have to sort of fit what that point is. Um, and so things, things become a little more, more complicated. Um, and then lastly, uh, I promise this is, the, this is the most complicated slide I'll have. Um, we could actually go back to that fundamental model that, that I showed you before, assuming that this, this muscle is ellipsoidal. Maybe it's not a circular ellipse, but it's ellipsoidal. So when the cross-sectional area increases in the middle, um, that's how you know, there's a corresponding length change according to an ellipsoid equation, um, and that's what we're seeing. Um, so this is... At this stage, you know the the scheme of models that I personally plan to um, plan, plan to to execute. Um, but as I said, you know this is this is under this is this is currently evolving, um, and so well, you know I'm sure I'll adapt as I depending on what I see in the data. Um, briefly, um, so so these are some other possible possible sensors that that I'll use for um, that I may or may not use for for validation. Um, you know, depending on the application, um, we may or may not, uh, will depend on how much we care about the accuracy of the forces that we're seeing. Um, all models are wrong, some models are useful. Um, but some of the places we might start looking for validation that, that what we're seeing is actually muscle force. Um, the most straightforward but also very challenging way would be to get an animal model and actually, you know, cut it open and, and strap a buckle, buckle, tendon, uh, buckle sensor to, to their tendon. Uh, if I find the right collaborator, maybe we'll do this. Um, but that's a little more challenging. Um, on the other hand, um, one thing we do have a lot of in the Baichi lab is other sensors that we can use to, to corroborate the kind of data that we're seeing. Uh, so one that I work with sometimes is called acoustic myography. Um, so in addition to, um, to, to, to deformation, uh, muscles also vibrate um, when they, they execute motions. Um, and you can use that to say something about, about muscle force. Um, so we're working with that. Um, and, and another student, Zoe Cohen, in, in uh, Ruzhina's lab is also working with a, a technology called cine-dense MRI that can give you displacement maps of a muscle um, at, a, at a higher resolution. Um, so you know, we'll be starting in the future to look at, at how um, consistent those things are. So um, I think I'll, I'll briefly, maybe I'll share one of the proof of concept applications that I'm interested in since um, uh, I think we're we're wrapping up at this stage, um, but you know, the, the, as, as I just said, you know, all models are wrong. Some models are useful, um, and so there's a couple of different places uh, based on sort of the application areas I showed you before that we're really interested in, in, in targeting. So. Um, just to start, um, I've showed you a lot of three-dimensional data um, that's not really you know, explicitly uh, useful to control yet. They've all been static scans. Um, but we've started investigating you know, how we might you know, use these static models um, uh, or be able to, to gather this kind of data, this kind of cross-sectional area data in real time. Um, so this is, this is the cross-section of a muscle. Um, and, and this is you know, work from, from several of my undergrads. Um, the, you know, even just using out-of-the-box OpenCV uh, optical flow, Lucas Canade tracking, uh, we can already start to get a pretty um, robust uh, signal that we can that we can actually track. So, um, so, th so you know, it's very promising. Um, just to convince you that 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 these are signals that we could gather in process. Um, you know, it's it's sort of an open question how well the static models will describe what we're seeing, but that's what we're investigating. That's why we're here. So. Um, so one really straight, I think, I think maybe the most straightforward um, application based on the signal you just saw um, has to do with uh, device control. So in this case, um, starting with an external device, so we don't have to worry about the device's impact on the human, um, I want to show you just a proposed application for how you could use this to, to better control a device and, and make it more expressive. So you know, let's say the, the Let's say you're in a situation where using a goniometer or motion capture, uh, you're, just, you're controlling a, a robot arm, uh, you know, output force via just PD control. Um, so, so input, basically, you know, having the robot track the same angle as your, as your arm using a, um, uh, using, using, you know, basically just, just one-to-one -one tracking, um, uh, stiffness modulated by, by these parameters here. So one way in which people, um, 
do, one way in which people augment this right now um, is using EMG, that technology that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and because EMG is so messy, um, most, not only controllers for, for robots, but also for things like prosthetics, the way that people usually control them is using a differential signal. So looking at the difference between your biceps and your triceps, um, using that as a signal to, to, to say, you know, I want to track this particular output force um, in addition to the, the, perhaps the angle. Um, the problem with this is that this is not really representative of what the output force should be. This is more of a differential signal that describes how stiff your, your arm is. Um, because we don't, um, you know, really what we want is the absolute force that you want to, that you want to exert. So, so the proposed addition from, from our work would be to, instead of using these, these EMG to, to, to determine the force, use those EMG to, to describe the stiffness parameters of the robot and actually extract the, the desired force directly uh, using some the, the deformation signal that we described. Uh, so that's one, one particular sort of toy application that we're looking at. Um, and, a, and, a, and a sort of, the thing to have in your head here is applications where maintaining a particular stiffness is really important. Uh, so something like ball catching would be really interesting, where you care about you know, force and stiffness and, and position all at the same time. Um, and that's, that's really challenging right now. So that's one possible direction we could go. Um, I'll, I'll kind of skip through this one. Um, basically, you know, it could help uh, generate, uh, help us better understand existing muscle modeling systems. Uh, so things like OpenSim, uh, anybody that try to, try to measure or try to infer forces right now just via optimization and cost functions. Um, we can use this to, to understand better, um, you know, how, um, you know, under, understand, understand these systems better and determine whether the cost functions they're using are actually representative of, of the body. Um, and then lastly, um, I think I'll, I'll uh, close really soon, I promise. <laughs> but um, lastly, you know, we have a, a you know, I keep, I keep showing this picture. The, the weird thing about this picture is that, you know, these are really complicated boxes, right? The brain, the spine, and the, the nervous system. Uh, they're very complicated, but we actually do have ways of probing the brain um, the spine and, and the input signals to these muscles using uh, EEG, you know, nerve cuffs. Uh, some of them are very invasive, but we can do it. Uh, EMG. What we haven't been able to probe yet is this output that I'm trying to measure, this, this muscle force output. Um, so really what I think of this as is closing the loop. We finally get this final measurement that can tell us, you know, how this whole system's working together. Um, and then, you know, not only can this maybe make um, these sensor values that we're getting more interpretable, so things like EMG that look really messy, maybe we can better understand uh, what we're looking at. Um, but you know, all these different pathologies that occur in different, different levels of the system, we can start better understanding how they interact in the context of the full loop. Um, so with that, I think I will uh, skip, skip our alternate modality for, for the sake of Rujna and just skip towards you know, the, the, the core ideas that I presented today. So let's see if I can. Yeah, so, so basically what I've, what I've shown you today is a, is a sampling of the research done in, in Ruzhna's lab. Um, specifically, um, you know, a couple of different things that, that, that I see as the, as the promising, most promising pieces of this technology. Uh, first, I showed you um, a deformation data set um, that's the first of its kind, uh, no one's ever built one before, um, with all of the code which we've, we've released and we're planning on releasing more of these, this code as I, as I, as I build it. Um, and we really hope that other people will use it um, because I think there's very few people in this field um, and so you know, I'm looking to, to get more people into it. Um, and in particular, there are some applications that I haven't even talked about today. Um, so I've mostly talked about biomechanics, um, but things like you know, animation, Pixar cares a lot about you know, how their characters look um, and this can maybe tell them a little bit more about uh, how muscles uh, interact um, and how they should look on screen. Um, secondly, you know, the core of the work, um, I'm planning to, to build a suite of models um, that will give us the first in vivo non-invasive measures of muscle force. And then lastly, um, I showed you a couple of proof of concept applications uh, that can, can illustrate, especially for a robotics audience, the utility of, of why I'm doing this. Um, so with that, uh, I want to just thank my many, many uh, collaborators and, and, and uh, 
co uh, co-workers on this project. Uh, specifically, of course, um, my wonderful advisor, Rujana Baichi, um, who has been you know, indispensable, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, as well as the rest of my, my thesis committee, um, a number of researchers in the lab, and then actually a number of these, uh, all, most of these people here are undergraduate students that I've worked with. Um, they've done a lot of the work on actually training the neural networks um, and, and dealing with a lot of the data processing for me. Um, so, you know, I don't know, um, I hear it's harder here to get, get undergrads in to research, um, but I really encourage you to, to you know, encourage younger students to, to help out where it's possible, um, because I think that can really you know, change the game in terms of how much research you can do as a, as a graduate student, um, but also you know, what they do with the rest of their lives. Um, uh, so with that, um, I'll close, and uh, happy to take questions and, and pass it off to Rujna. Or uh, questions, discussion? No, this is probably outside of your field for most of you, <laughs> but happy to take questions about Berkeley in general, too. <laughs> OK, so I will have one, <laughs> maybe two. OK, sure, <laughs> of course. Uh, I wonder. Uh, why you have selected uh, these muscles and whether, whether it uh, really has some impact on uh, measurements and, and collecting data and so on, or uh, you see more opportunities uh, using these, or what, what, was, what was the reason, or whether it's uh, part of bigger project? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So the question is, uh, you know, why, why measure the biceps specifically um, in, in the arm? Um, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. So, so one is, I think the, the community is a lot bigger looking at lower limb mechanics right now. Um, and I think you can get, so, so first, my first decision was I decided I wanted to work on upper limb, right? Um, a, you know, there's less competition, but also there's a lot, I think, you know, our lower limb devices right now are a lot better than our upper limb devices. Um, right now, you know, the most, uh, the most used prosthetic, I think, is still a hook because it's very intuitive, and, and you know these myoelectric devices aren't actually that much better and more effective. Um, and so I was trying to choose a problem that would maybe lead to the next generation of dexterous devices. That was kind of my motivating uh, motivating factor. Um, the you know, but the hand is very complicated, I think, on a, on a number of levels. And we wanted to choose a, a muscle group that will, um, you know, A, is still small enough that we can scan it um, in, a, in a reasonable manner, but also uh, has a large enough signal that we can be sure that even with our, you know, preliminary rough methods, we can actually see the signals that we're looking for. Um, and in addition to that, you know, each, if you look at the different joints of the arm, you know, wrist and hand, extremely complicated. You've got all of these fingers and, and this supination, pronation. Uh, shoulder is also insanely complicated, even though it seems a little bit simpler. Uh, you know, the elbow is a natural choice as a, you know, you can model it in the sagittal plane um, as, a, as a starting point, basically, for, for, for this kind of a research. Uh, but we definitely hope that it will, you know, extend to other, other muscle groups in the body um, and that we can, you know, build up, build up hopefully, you know, full body models eventually. So there's also lots of balance things that you could do, um, all sorts of things like that. Okay. Oh, of course. Uh, so you said one thing in the, um, in the uh, talk that you, uh, nobody knows anything about fatigue. <laughs> But uh, my question, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. But w my question is: is have you, when you're actually uh, doing the scans, have you tested to? Underneath. So, so the question here, I'll, I can just repeat it for you. Um, so the question was: have we done any experiments on fatigue? Um, and the answer is, for right now, not explicitly, because we're trying to control for as much as we can. Um, but inherently, we're seeing, you know, fatigue is definitely a source of noise for us. Um, because, for example, um, you know, in order to take a full, um, a full scan of your arm, um, that takes a little bit of time. It's not instantaneous. So that means that people are maintaining particular forces. Uh, we chose them so that they could maintain them. We had them, you know, maximally contract and then, uh, and then hold something for a while. And actually, in the second data set, we had visual feedback on how much force they were, they were exerting. Um, but the... Um, 
but you know, inherently, you know, you, you get a little bit of the, the shaking and the, you know, a little bit of fatigue in the in the model. Um, so, you know, absolutely, that's a direction that we plan to go with this. Um, you could probably think of, you know, a multitude of things we could study. Um, we tried doing, you know, with a different lab, a different fatigue study once um, using like sweat sensors, but it, the, the resolution was too low. So we we don't have any insights yet. But I think it's a very er interesting uh, area of research. Thank you. Uh, but we have a question. Okay, question. I was just wondering, you said at the end that it's difficult to probe the uh, muscle force. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just thinking when, it, when related to the uh, biceps uh, study, uh, well, it could be related to the pressure that's mm -hmm. imposed on the hand when they're trying to lift something up, like measuring it indirectly by, by measuring the pressure imposed on the on the palm while lifting when lifting something up yeah yeah so that's um i guess i i sort of skipped it through time i have i have a few slides on this but but basically the the fundamental challenge that we're addressing here is yes you can you can slap an external force sensor on and that's that's initially what we did and that's that output torque that we're measuring um for for these these problems so that output torque in the data set I showed was just weights at the wrist, um, so comparing the different weights. But in the second round of experiments, I think I just alluded to, the, um, we had somebody pressing upward on a force sensor. And that was generating our data at different, different force conditions. Um, the, the challenge that I'm actually trying to tackle is that that's just the, the total joint torque, right? That's not, that's not individual muscles. And one of the things that's really not yet understood in biomechanics is that, you know, if I'm just holding my hand right here, maintaining balance, um, you know, there are three different muscle groups that are helping me flex, and one muscle group, sort of, that's helping me extend, the triceps. So um, if, I'm, if I'm here, I can actually flex my arm and stay at the same position, and the force torque sensor here is not going to register anything different. But, you know, this muscle is pulling and this muscle is pulling together to maintain a particular uh, location. Most muscle modeling systems right now will just say, okay, humans are minimizing energy, um, so therefore the biceps is pulling, they'll give you the first condition. You know, the biceps is pulling just enough to hold up my arm and the triceps isn't pulling at all. And we already know that in order to create these smooth motions, there's a lot of stiffness modulation that happens across these two different muscle groups. So when I do this, I'm not just holding up my arm with my biceps, I'm also maintaining some stiffness with my triceps. So what we're trying to do with this research is probe individual muscles in order to figure out, you know, what, what, how these synergistic, um, you know, motions are happening. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'm happy to talk afterwards as well. I think we're <laughs> moving on to, to Vrishna's talk. Um, yeah, okay. thank you all very so, much. So I don't see any other questions. I have some, but <laughs> we, will, we will be together so we can, but, but maybe, maybe, maybe just one of these. Mm -hmm. uh, do you consider individual differences? Are there some? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so um, one of the major challenges with any human subjects research, and one of the reasons that I'm mostly working with a healthy population right now is because even within that healthy population, there's so much diversity in terms of, um, in terms of how people look. Um, so one of the things, our, our second data set, um, we actually collected scans from uh, 12 different, or 10 different people, or 11. Um, and that's another thing we'll definitely be looking at is just variations across people and if there are signals that are robust to different individuals. Um, and I, I do realize that's still a very small data set when it comes to biomechanics, um, but you know, the challenging, you know, the, excuse me, the challenges to, to gaining this kind of data. Um, you know, we probably won't scale up with the, the full volumetric data, but once that informs where we look for some of these signals, um, we hope to scale up even more um, because there's a huge amount of diversity. Um, and, and that's honestly one of the reasons our literature values are so bad um, is because you know, everyone is very different.